So for our next talk, we have uh, people who have, quite, uh, who have come quite from far away from Brazil and Portugal uh, to talk about property search and how multimodal LM-based search assistance can improve property search. Um, yeah, we have Tatjana, Julio, and Lukas from Quinto Andor to give a presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, there will be as many as three of us because we were sampling from, from the large team, but we will be disciplined with time, don't worry. Uh, my name is Tatiana. Uh, I'm head of data science at Kinto Andar. Uh, Julio is staff data scientist and uh, Lucas is uh, staff machine learning engineer. And we will talk about uh, building a multimodal LLM-based search assistant chatbot. But uh, of course we have absolutely, absolutely unique internal uh, name for this project. We call it Copilot. So, <laughs> Uh, yes, uh, and we will uh, talk a little bit about details, how we did it. So uh, we will put you a little bit into the context of what our company does, explain uh, why we uh, decided to build the assistant this way, and what were the main components, and of course, of course, uh, what were the lessons learned on this uh, very fun uh, journey. Uh, so... Uh, Kinto Andar is one of the largest uh, property tech companies in Latin America. Uh, we help people to find houses to live or to rent. And what is important, we provide many useful uh, additional services uh, to do that. So, uh, for example, we guarantee for the landlord that tenant will pay the rent on time uh, during all, um, all the period of the contract or we allow people schedule uh, visits to the uh, places uh, online and reschedule them online, sign the contracts online. So I don't know how good is real estate market in Germany. In Portugal, we would love to have the same services available. It would make uh, our life so much easier. So uh, our headquarter is in Sao Paulo, Brazil. We operate in five more countries. But uh, and we have a technical hub in Portugal. So in terms of the uh, information retrieval game, it's very interesting because we have millions of people uh, visiting our platforms every month, uh, millions of properties uh, listed. So search is uh, super nice, super great thing to do. Sorry, I am a bit nervous also. <laughs> I trained for a long time, but uh yeah okay so uh, why copilot uh, why this assistant chatbot um when it comes to the rent in uh, your house ideal experience is not using filters on site or uh, using a free even not using a perfect uh, search text box ideal experience is talking to the great agent who will uh, put you in the context of your problem uh, understand what you really need will know all the neighborhoods so uh, when we were deciding to invest uh, in this product uh, we thought that uh, our mission is trying to bridge the gap about experience that users have uh, when they use filters on site an experience of talking to a human who really understands your problem. And of course, uh, we had a strategic vision that if we don't start investing in LLM-based and multimodal-based search now, in a couple of years, we will be very much behind the race. So uh, <clears throat> before we started building our pro uh, product, all searches were only filter-based. And uh, we already knew that um, we already knew that uh, users are doing a ton of things uh, behind our application. For example, uh, if you like certain uh, visual aspect of interior, like wooden floor, you would need to go to each uh, property and manually check: does it have wooden floor? No. Then, uh, if you want to check if your apartment is close to supermarkets, uh, you will need to go to the map and check if it is close to the supermarkets. 
Uh, if you're looking for a place to relocate with kids, you, uh, you want to find a good school, uh, you, also, you again, you need to think about what combination of filters will get you there. So uh, we can add more and more filters here, but we, uh, we knew this is not a scalable way to solve the problems. Uh, and uh, what do we have now? Uh, this is really how our uh, pro product works, uh, despite we translated everything to English from Portuguese, but this is live product. Uh, I'm not sure how visible this is. Okay, so uh, user asks for apartment in Copa. Copa is a slang name of Copacabana in Rio de Janeiro. Uh, price range between 10K and 20K with wooden floor. And you can see that immediately uh, the chat recognized uh, that uh, location is Copacabana. Selected filters are apartment, price range, uh, wooden floor as visual aspect. Uh, it understood the slang, so it understood that Copa is Copacabana. And behind the scenes, it also understood that uh, with this price range, uh, this is a uh, rent, uh, so person wants to rent something and not buy a house. And if you are lucky with how Copilot understood you, you can go to the search, and you can see that this first beautiful apartment obviously has a wooden floor. Uh, the price range is correct. Location is correct. So the product uh, is doing what we expected. What is hidden behind the scenes? So it fundamentally has a two big parts. Uh, first one is data collector chat. So we need to know what to search. So chat will keep talking to a user until we get enough data. Second is a search engine, uh, which will retrieve the information. How architecture looks like. This is a first high level view into the architecture. So we take a plain te text from the chat, go to the chat service, Chat service has uh, many functionalities, but uh, basically it will extract filters from the chat, uh, support the conversation, keep the user state. As soon as we are ready to search, uh, we will go to the search service where hybrid search will be performed. Uh, we will start with talking about chat. Uh, let's zoom in a little bit more. So this is a chat solution, uh, another high-level architecture. <laughs> we will go even uh, lower. So as you see, we decided to go with a router solution. Uh, we have a moderator at the beginning, beginning and all prompt injections and uh, simply inappropriate conversations are handled here. Uh, then we can send user to support chatbot, uh, to the end of chatbot, but as we already know from the practice, most of users will go to the search flow API, uh, the core part of the system. So let's zoom even more to the search flow API. Uh, Julia will give you more interesting details of this, uh, but uh, basically search flow has two big parts. One, as I mentioned before, uh, is filter extractor the heart of our system, converting the plain text uh, into JSON with uh, filters. And second is chat answering part, uh, which helps to maintain the conversation. Uh, it is capable to do some location suggestions and keep the conversation going. So over to Julio to give you all meaty details of the solution. Thank you, Tanya. Hello. So. Let's do a deep dive a bit in the filter extractor. So this is an important component of the search flow because basically this is the interface uh, with the search service. So what we are doing here is we are taking the user input and we are converting into a JSON. And this JSON will be later translated into, into an actual query that will be consumed by the search service. So this filter extractor is actually we call it extractor, but it's actually updating information. 
So we can imagine that the user is already interacting with the with the chat. So we already have some JSON from previ previous interactions. So we receive a new input, and what we do is that we update this JSON. So we can include new information, probably new filters. We can update existing filters, or we can remove it, depending on what is coming from the textual input. So this, this is an actual complex task because we have lots of different filters. So we have 70 plus uh, possible different information, deterministic information that we can extract, which is a lot. So here are some examples. So for instance, the property type, if the, it's a house or an apartment, uh, the business context, which is if it's for rent or for sale, amenities and installations. So all of these informations uh, are part of that, this JSON that can have up to 71 different types of filters. And we also extract a, uh, what we call a visual element, which is what we will be using, and Lucas will talk about this later, this is what we will be using to do the visual multimodal search. So basically, we try to extract something from the input uh, that we can use to do image search. And this is also being done by this extractor. And here we have actually an individual extraction with moderation as well, so we don't extract anything uh, from this. So we, we limit what we can extract, and then we join everything in a single JSON. So here's an example of a JSON. Of course, this can scale a lot, depending on how long is the conversation and depending on what the user is asking. But we can see more or less what the JSON looks like. So we have things like property type and the visual search there. We can see it's a list of strings that we'll be using for do the multimodal search. And we'll be seeing this later. So here, how the extractor, how we are handling this extraction. So first, we take whatever the user already provided which is the JSON that represents the user preferences for now. And then we take a new input. So for instance, the user is actually updating the number of bedrooms and he's asking for industry style. So what we do, we do this in two steps. So we first do a classification. So this is basically a multi-target classification that we are doing for now with LLMs because we still don't have enough data for training a new model. So for now, we're doing this with LLM call. So this is a multi-target classification that is basically classifying, okay, what filters are in this input? And then what we do is that we pass uh, this to the actual updater. And we say, okay, so those are the two filters you must update. And the, this updater, which is another LLM call, will actually do the update. So in this example, We'll be changing bedrooms from three to two, and we'll updating the industry style. So we do this in these two steps. Um, and as Tanya mentioned, we also have this chant answering part. I will not deep dive on this, just a highlight here. But basically, we can think about two modules. So one module has the entire conversational history, uh, and this module knows everything that this future extractor API is doing. So we, you, we use this module to communicate the user whatever uh, related to future. So this module knows how to communicate changes in the future. And we also have a location module that can handle with some limitations uh, location information. Before we go into search, let me speak a bit about how do we evaluate the entire chat which we think it's an interesting topic. So like this is the, the, the entire uh, architecture, right? So basically, those numbers is, are where we collect data. So we collect data from the input, from the output of the moderator. We collect the classifications from the router, which is also classifier. We collect data in number four from the entire search flow. Number five is everything this, the chat is answering to the user. And we also log the, the prompts in production so we double check that we are actually using the appropriate prompt, prompts in production. And de depending on the task, we do different types of evaluation. So we always do offline and online evaluation for all of the tasks here, for all the components. For offline evaluation, we always use golden data sets. So we manually produce golden data sets to do some offline evaluation. 
and online evaluation, of course, we're using production data. And sometimes we use classical machine learning evaluation. Sometimes we are using JETS. So we use LLMs to, to do the evaluation. So how, how is the difference here? So for objective and deterministic tasks, such as the router and the filter extractor, we are doing classical machine learning evaluation. And for more uh, open-ended questions and subjective tasks, we are using LLMs. So the visual aspects is a nice example of this because it's a list of strings. So it's hard to compare. I mean, the ground truth and the prediction may have different lengths and the text must be different. So this is hard to evaluate. It's easier to do something with the judge, for example. Uh, classical machine learning, as I said, we use offline. And LLM as a judge, we use both online and offline, depending on the task. And with classical machine learning, we can have more granular metrics, while with the judge, we are producing more generic metrics. So here's a, an example for the filter extractor. So we can, with classical machine learning, we can have like, like F1 scores, so traditional metrics for every individual uh, filter. While with LLMs as a judge, what we do is that we do a more generic uh, evaluation into the input level. So we have an input, for instance, Santa Cecilia, two bedrooms. Santa Cecilia, by the way, it's a neighborhood in Sao Paulo. So we classify, we evaluate if the extraction as a whole for this input is correct or incorrect. And how we are doing this with the JUD? So basically we follow these four steps. And the, the first one is the most important one because basically what we are doing, we are trying to simplify the original task. So the original task here is, for instance, the extractor, right? So we first simplify this test too, so we can have an accurate uh, uh, evaluation with the JUD. So it's correlated to our actual manual label data set. Then we do a classical chain of thoughts and we provide a grading criteria and we ask the model to, to, do, to give a score reason, right? So let me give you an actual example. So here again, Santa Cecilia, which is a neighborhood uh, and two bedrooms. So this is, uh, it's, it's not all, this is just a part of what's going to the JUD, okay? But this is the main component of the JUD. So the JUD is receiving, okay, this is the user input. This is the current user preferences. And what, we, what the model is doing is he changed the location. So is this correct or not? So we can see that we somehow simplified the extractor task and we basically said, oh, the extractor action was to change the location. Is this correct or not? And then the judge can evaluate, okay, this is correct because uh, we changed the location, actually. So the user had a different location and we changed it to Santa Cecilia. But the user asked for two bedrooms and this is where already in the filters. So this is correct as well. There's nothing to do here. So that's how more or less we, we are using LLM as a judge. So we simplify the task. The score is more generic, but we can compute this online once we fine tune the prompt and we know uh, we our judge is good. So this is basically how we're doing the evaluation. And here is an overall architecture of our evaluation. So we have an important component there, which is uh, golden data sets. So we take our production data and we also include some corner cases, manually include some corner cases. So we can actually build golden data sets, which we use uh, in offline evaluation and CI/CD. So every time we change something, we check if we are still with uh, the same level of accuracy before deployment. And we have the online evaluation, which takes production data and renders types of evaluation that I, that I just mentioned. So we can have some error online. And we have internal abstraction that's being used uh, by all of our systems, which handles both type of evaluation. Okay, so let me speak a bit about things that we tried and what worked best. So once we were building this entire architecture, we began like trusting a lot uh, entirely on LLMs uh, instead of doing complex engineering architectures. And, but at the end of the day, we arrive at the middle ground. So we ended up with the, that architecture that you saw, which has a router, it has some level of a state machine, right? Combined with LLM calls. Uh, in terms of the filter extractor, we also try this like 
let's try to do this filter update in a single call with function calling and things like that. It was not that accurate because we have a lot of filters. So we tried a very granular approach. So breaking down the text into chunks, trying to classify each individual chunk, and then doing the extraction, it was not also accurate. Then we evolved to this two-step approach. And we, what we are also doing is that we are doing individual uh, extraction for difficult components. So for instance, amenity installations and visual elements are two individual complex components that we are handling with individual LM calls, and then we merge everything together in this final JSON. And finally, in terms of evaluation, we tried, in the very beginning, we, we, we didn't have production data, right? So we didn't have user data. So how do you know if we're doing well? So we, we tried building some synthetic data sets with LMs as well, and with some business rules. But what actually worked was to manually label data and generate corner cases. So that's how we began. So generating, manually generating data sets. And that helped us to like, before doing any sort of uh, actual deployment and user tests that allow us to, this is an actual, an actual plot. This, those are actual numbers. So like in a one month window, we, we were able to somehow access our errors and improve our extractor before doing any release and before having any sort of data. So we, we've done that with uh, manual labeled coding data sets. So that's it for the chat. So now what we will be seeing is how we are actually doing the search. So how do we consume this JSON and how do we do the search? So this is what Lucas is going to talk about. Yes, thank you very much. Are you listening to me? Okay. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the search part, which I think it's uh, something that makes sense in this conference, right? Uh, so let me just quickly go back here to the product. So uh, Tanya showed a picture in the beginning that showed the interface that we have in the app. Uh, so in theory, where we are right now is uh, the user already said what the user wants, right? So uh, it already used like just text to reflect on what are their preferences. If everything got well with the LLM and there were no hallucinations, we should be able to do a search with the preferences that the user runs, right? So what we are going to talk here is how this is actually happening, right? How are we translating this uh, query, which is coming from unstructured text and uh, later passing through an LLM to generate the results that the user actually wants to see. But before getting into how this is working right now with the uh, the whole chat uh, implementation, uh, we'll just quickly go back to how things worked before we had a chat uh, with all the LMs and all the things going on, right? So in the app, what we have is uh, essentially a, a very big form where the user can select all the things that they want in the house, right? So the user can say whatever the price they, they're looking for, whatever... Uh, um, the features they're looking in the house, whether uh, they want you know, a house with a pool or without a pool and all this. So we have all this inside this house features block that we are showing here. But also there is a very important information, which is location, right? So when you're looking for a house, you generally have uh, a rough uh, understanding of where you want to live. So these two set of features are very important and, and they are uh, actually used as a first step uh, in our retrieval state. So this information is actually using for filtering out things. So uh, we after this first stage of retrieval, we should be uh, able to have a, can, a list of candidate houses that were then, like, yeah, and this was, I think, clearly explained on some of the previous presentations, we will be, we'll be dealing with a ranking here. So we, we have a two-step ranker. We have a light ranker that runs within OpenSearch, and we also have a heavy ranker that is an ML model that is considering user interaction uh, uh, features and all these kinds of things. So then once we have this uh, happening, we, we then show the results to, to the user, right? Now that we have a chat for collecting data, and it's very uh, important to mention here that now all this information here, including location and house features, are coming from the chat itself. Uh, we also added a new dimension, uh, as Julia mentioned, which is the visual preferences. And now, so the user can now freely uh, describe what are the things that they wanted to look into uh, the pictures of the houses, right? So we need to update our, our, our retrieval and ranking system to reflect on this. Like, how can we use this information to uh, uh, help the user and improve the search results, right? So this is basically uh, what we want to do. Uh, but just to quickly recall, uh, 
this information that is coming from the user is coming as text, right? So we extract this as a list of strings, essentially. And the information that we want to compare to are house images, right? So we have different kinds of uh, uh, data here uh, that we want to compare. So this was uh, covered very well by, by Joe, but I think it's uh, very nice for us to just quickly glance here. Uh, thankfully, we have this multi-model embeddings, right? So these are uh, models and ways of training models that allow you to translate uh, this unstructured data into a representation that allows you to compare them, right? So in the end of the day, what we want is comparing text with images. So we have here a, a, a non-exhaustive list of models that are open source. You can actually uh, uh, use them or you know recreate their uh, structure to generate those embeddings and actually perform. So this enters in that um, abstraction of pi encoders, right? So we can generate independent uh, embeddings that are going, going to be used for, for this search. So we are using this, this technology to support this change, right? Um, but that's not enough, right? So having uh, the embeddings is one very important uh, first step, but we also have to deal with how exactly we are going to use this on our search. So if you recall correctly, we have for a given query, we might have more than one uh, text, right? More than one sentence. So in this example that we're showing here, uh, we have a looker, uh, a user that is looking for a house with wooden floor, big windows, and modern decoration. So after all the LLM calls, what we, we end up with is a list of three elements here, which is first wooden floor, second big windows, and modern decoration. And in our index, our houses might have uh, many images, right? So if you have a big house, you're probably going to have more images. Uh, so uh, all these uh, things need to somehow be compared in such a way that we have in the end of this comparison, comparison a single number that represents this matching between this set of texts and the set of images, right? So this is what I'm calling here a scoring function. Uh, so we need to, to solve this, right? So we need to uh, decide on how to, to manage this, this kind of situation. Uh, it's interesting to see that the approach that we're taking here is very similar to the patching uh, of the embeddings approach. So uh, essentially we are doing uh, is for each one of the houses, we uh, perform a pairwise cousin similarity between all the texts and all the images. So we have one embedding representation for each image, one embedding representation for each uh, text segment, and we perform uh, the, the cosine similarity, we basically compute a, a distance matrix uh, between this, this set of embeddings, right? Once we have this, uh, we are performing a, a basically a max, uh, max operation uh, grouped by the visual preference. So for each one of those uh, uh, text embeddings, we are, are going to choose uh, the, the image that actually maximizes this similarity. Once we have this, we have a single score, which we're calling here the image score, that should represent the matching between the visual matching, let's say, let's put it in this way, between the text and the, the, the houses that we are looking for. And of course, we need to do this for all the houses. So here we have house A, and we need to perform basically the same operation for house B. So once with this is done, uh, we should end up with a single uh, score for the image. But again, if you recall correctly from uh, the, the, the first picture that we showed from how the system worked, we don't have uh, a single score just for the image, right? So we have other things. We have a light ranker, we have a high, uh, heavy ranker. So right now this the all these scores are combined. So for each one of those uh, houses, we are going to end up with a single score. And then we have the, the usual just ranking and top K uh, uh, selection. So we can actually show these results to the user. So this is basically how we are handling uh, images on our... Uh, retrieval system. Uh, again, as uh, Julia mentioned on the chat, like how are we evaluating this? Like how is it's very important for us to, especially adding this new dimension, which is uh, the, the images, how is our system system behaving? So similarly, uh, this is still a search system, right? So this is still a relevant system. So we still need to track all the metrics that we usually track uh, on such systems, right? So given the search results and given the user interaction after uh, the existence of these results, we can compute relevance metrics. We can also compute more kind of business conversion metrics. In this case, for example, at Quintonar, we want to know whether a search uh, somehow was connected to a visit or if it was connected to a new contract or something like this. So this um, measures the overall health of the of the system. Uh, but it's important, especially now that we are adding this this new this new layer, this you know multimodality to the whole system which is being able to explain a little bit and see if the experience that we are showing to the user 
uh, is actually reflecting the images. So in a, in a very similar way uh, that we did on the chat, we can also use LLMs as a judge to actually see and evaluate if the results of the search that we're uh, uh, given to the users make sense. So in this case specifically, given a search result and a user query, we just basically ask those multi-model LLMs whether the results address the user requirements. Of course, this is something that you have to do, like you have to kind of see whether it makes sense or not, because uh, in some cases, for example, we noticed some, some bugs in our models that they couldn't correctly represent some kinds of uh, visual uh, elements. So having this uh, LLMs being able to uh, automatically evaluate the results allow you to actually pick up those those specific issues earlier. So this is something that we are actually improving a little bit and trying to explore whether uh, uh, this is going to be very helpful uh, in a production uh, setting, right? Uh, so just to summarize a little bit of the things and some of the learnings that we had and things that we were thinking about the in terms of improvements for the system in, in the future, uh, we actually had to, uh, uh, during the whole process, uh, think a lot about like performance and how we would deal with all those embeddings. So we have many houses, we have many images per houses. So we actually had to think about how to improve the performance for this whole system. So one of the approaches that we took were actually very similar to the clustering blade based one that Joe mentioned. We actually perform a clustering and select images that represent those clusters and just index those images. So instead of having all the images that might be representing the same visual uh, aspects, we actually uh, uh, cluster them and just uh, pick those representative examples to index and perform the actual search on this. So this was a very important thing uh, for the for the development. Um, we also tested different similarity aggregation strategies. So right now, if you recall, we are uh, performing the sum of max. We also tried other combinations. So we also tried averaging the sums, averaging the maxims, uh, maximum max of the maxes, and each one of them had have different consequences in terms of the experience that you show to the user. It, it is even possible that you might have different strategies for different users. This is something that we discussed before, like uh, uh, some users are looking specifically for a, one a visual aspect and, and they think that this is very important. So depending on the aggregation strategy that you're using, uh, you might end up with a different result with different quality for different users. Uh, in terms of future, uh, I think we talked a little bit about here uh, about hybrid search. Right now, we are just performing mostly vector search for the image and you know re-ranking. Uh, but we also understand that it's possible that you know PM twenty five can be helpful if we are able to create good descriptions of those houses. So, let's say we can use, for example, GPT four or any other good LLM for generating texts and very detailed descriptions, we could probably be using, you know, more traditional full text, you know, lexical search to uh, enhance those results together with the with the house um, images. Uh, uh, beyond this, uh, talking a little bit about the, the granularity levels. Right now, we're, we're looking mainly at image level embeddings, uh, but we understand that if we could have, for example, a representation that uh, gave us... Um, most of the information encoded in a single embedding for the whole house, this would also help uh, us in terms of performance of the search and, and maybe uh, even, even in, in some other metrics. Uh, another thing that is also in our mind and we're actually working uh, actively on this is on our heavy ranker stage, we should probably in the future consider image features as well, or at least some kind of aggregation of those image features. Right now, the, um, the ranker doesn't consider image features, so you might have some incompatibility, right? You might have, for example, a, a model that is ranking images uh, based on similarity, and then you have a re-ranker that actually kind of makes it kind of a mess in terms of the ranks that they generate regarding the, the images, right? So having a ranker that reflects on the, on the image features is also something that could be very important. Uh, and finally, one of the downsides of the approach that we are taking, which is using images mainly for ranking, is that we are not able to, um, filter out results that are not matching this. So it's very hard to define a matching when you're dealing with embeddings because you basically you need to pick a threshold, right? And picking thresholds is really hard. Like it's something that it's a, a very hard task, especially on this on this model. So uh, we are still kind of exploring ways of how, how we should be doing this, but it would be really nice if a user said, okay, uh, I'm looking for, a, a, I don't know, a green pool. And if we don't have a green pool, we actually don't show any results. But right now the experience is not exactly this because we can't remove things based on 
on the embedding similarity, just uh, uh, without a threshold, right? So I think this uh, wraps up uh, the search part. Uh, I hope I wasn't too fast or too low, uh, but I, I I wanted to use this uh, opportunity to actually thank the team. Like this uh, is a huge project. Like this is something that we are working for uh, quite some time here uh, at the company. And it's, we are just here representing, uh, you know, a pool of very brilliant engineers, PMs, designers, uh, data scientists. So uh, I like to use this opportunity to thank the team and, of course, you guys, uh, because this was a, a very interesting project to work on. And if you uh, are interested in the challenges, we are also actually hiring. So uh, let me know, like you can, you know, talk to us. Uh, it would be very welcome uh, uh, having, you know, people with lots of good knowledge about search and relevance. So feel free to reach out to us. And I think that's it for now. Thank you. Do we have any questions here in the room? Yeah. Hi, thanks for the talk. That was great. Um, wonderful case study. So um, when you've got your chatbot, obviously that's letting the user specify lots of filters. How do you avoid if they ask a very complex question or take it all the way down the rabbit holes, they've given you loads of filters and that's reduced the possible result set to the point where there's basically nothing matching their query. And obviously then they're going to think your search is broken. How do you deal with that? I will, I will take this. Uh, yes, that's actually one of the first problems we decided to tackle uh, after uh, first release. Uh, so we want to extend this to guided search and make a, actually leverage recommendations to make a suggestion uh, how to reduce either filter set or extend uh, filters maybe to multiple locations or uh, like uh, play with the price. So actually uh, we, uh, we're preparing to release this guided search feature that will navigate users to non-zero search results. We have one online question. Um... It's about guardrails. Did you implement, or how did you implement guardrails in your chatbot? How do you deal with security and possible abuse of your users by the chatbot? Is there anything you've done there? Yes, I can take this one. So yes, we have several layers of guardrails actually. So we have the providers, but guardrails, of course, we also use it. But this is this is the main guardrail we have, which is this custom moderator. And we have another one inside the search flow that is moderating what goes into the image search. So basically, those are also based on LLMs. And what we do is that we uh, try to avoid prompt in injection, harmful content. Um, and we do it. So every single user input goes into this query rail every time. And we call a second query rail inside the, the future extractor, which is to moderate. Uh, the visual components because those are also open uh, text so we we need to block uh, some of this text so we it doesn't go into the the image search i have a question more about the ux part of it uh, so traditionally i find that uh, classified ads websites have tried uh, full text search a number of times but users stick to the filters to the drop boxes uh, it's such an established domain, and we use those filters even in print in the old times. Um, so what's the nature of the question that they really want to have answered by the chatbot, and how much adaption is there? Yeah, I will take this one. This is actually a very good question, and uh, we see this pa uh, partially happening with our users. Uh, what we see is the promise, like what makes uh, the difference for users is ability to solve problems they are not able to solve with filters. And uh, this is like this ability uh, to search for visual aspects, uh, like in any uh, form that works for them. This is both coming from UX researchers and from actual results showing that uh, if user start using these visual filters, uh, actually the business metrics uh, going up. And currently what our product management team is working is like educating users what are the benefits for them to start talking to us. Like. I'd like to squeeze one in from online again. Um, uh, 
the question is what kind of annotation or labeling, labeling tools did you use to create your golden data set? Anything self-developed or what did you use for that? Yeah, we internally, we actually use Label Studio, uh, which is an open source tool for, I think they have a paid version as well. It's a service, but uh, we have a deployment uh, in-house uh, in which we uh, basically created a process there to annotate. It's a very complex process because we have 71 uh, futures and we noticed that this plays a very important role in evaluation because at least in the first times, uh, uh, we noticed that most of the time we were actually evaluating the annotator and not the the the, the tool itself because th there are so many annotation errors. It's, it's so hard to, to do this, that having a tool that kind of streamlines and help as much as possible the annotator doing this uh, 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 ended up, and then we choose this, this specific tool, which is Label Studio. Okay, I think we're at time. Sorry, maybe we can you can talk to Tatiana, Julio, and Lucas during the break. We have a fifty minute break, but first, thanks uh, again. Thank for you, everyone. Thank you.